thank you for having me. Um, my name is Darren Johnston. I'm managing director of Meyer Corporation. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of information about our company to begin, but I wanted to tell you the topic we're going to discuss today. So, uh, in talking with uh, Dr. McClure about kind of giving me some parameters for you today, uh, we want to talk about retail, and I'm going to I'm going to talk about retail and e-commerce and how e-commerce has really changed the consumer's path to purchase and what the effect of that has been, both on retailers as well as suppliers and companies like ourselves. We're a cookware manufacturer, um, so you guys are in the fashion world, uh, but the consumer path to purchase in retail and the effect of that is very, very similar. So the effects that we're seeing as a company are very similar to the effects that most of your fashion companies are also seeing, uh, depending on how they, how, what their go-to-market strategies are. Uh, we were just talking a little bit ago, and I was, I was talking about that I've been with Meyer 22 years, and um, I'm president of the U.S. and Latin America for the company, but 22 years ago when I started here, I was the account executive for the Southeast. Every single retail account that I was calling on and working with in the Southeast 22 years ago no longer exists. Isn't that amazing? That's how much retail has consolidated. At that point in time, we were doing... 80% of our business with probably 52 to 55 retailers. Now we do 80% of our business with about 17 to 18 retailers, including the big e-commerce guys like Amazon, Wayfair, people like that. So to, to uh, uh, another interesting point for you is that when I started as an account executive, a sales call looked very different than it does today. As an account executive, I used to walk in with samples, you'd meet with a buyer, You'd say, how many do you want to buy? You'd talk about features and benefits. You'd talk about, in, you know, in the case of fashion, you would be talking about uh, the details around the, the, the line for the spring or the fall or whatever the period of the season was. Uh, you'd walk out, you'd lay out a business plan for the next six months, you'd walk out. Now those meetings where there used to be two to three people sitting in those meetings, now those meetings in usually are 25 to 30 people. You've got a brick and mortar buyer, you've got an e-commerce buyer, you've got e-commerce planners, you've got brick and mortar planners, you've got digital asset managers, you've got regular retail managers, you've got so you've got all that you've got all the supply chain teams, you've got your SC search engine optimization, your digital analytics teams. The whole world has changed, and so that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today, and I'm going to try to give you some insight into how that has really affected retail as a whole, but also how it's affected suppliers like ourselves. Retail as a whole, but also how it's affected suppliers like ourselves. I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Meyer Corporation. So Meyer Corporation, uh, this, is, this is a little bit of who we are. Uh, we are the second largest cookware manufacturer in the world. Uh, we, our corporate office is in the United States where I work. I live in North Georgia, but I actually commute three weeks out of the month to San Francisco, California, so I spend as much time out there as I do here. Uh, I've been with the company 22 years. This is a little bit about our vision, industry trailblazer. Meyer paves the way forward in the culinary industry by raising the bar uh, for consumer expectations, bringing innovation, innovative products to the market, leveraging the latest market research technologies while adhering to the highest professional and ethical standards. So. Just a little bit about us. Uh, as far as who we are globally, this is where all of our global affiliates are. And so I actually run the US and Latin America, but you can see that we actually have marketing arms and affiliates and manufacturing located all over the world. We're a global, global manufacturer. <clears throat> and this is a little bit about our facilities and who, this is actually a picture of our facility outside of Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, we actually produce about 125 lines of cookware. We have 4 million square feet of factory space. We have 900,000 square feet of warehousing space. We distribute products in 30 countries. We employ about 5,000 people worldwide, and we produce on average about 150,000 pieces of cookware a day. So just some quick facts. And You've probably never heard of Meyer Corporation, but you've probably heard of some of these brands. We're a brand company. We actually market, uh, our strategy in retail is that we market brands from the high end to the low end. And so what you see here is Raffoni, Heston brands are located in the specialty high end gourmet. You'd see those products at Williams-Sonoma. You'd see a Farberware Silverstone product at Walmart. So 
we run the gamut. We don't have one brand that we try to sell all. We're a very unique entity in our industry. We're able to create unique shopping experiences and unique product assortments on a retailer by retailer basis based on the channels that we operate in. <coughs> and then this is just some firsts where we're very, very big on product innovation. Uh, and that's really what put us on the map. And so I, I won't get into the detail because I really want to get into the detail of what we're going to talk about today. But Meyer's known for a lot of firsts. And then here, this is an important part that we'll talk about today. You can see these are basically retailers, some of the key U.S. retail partners that we work with today. Uh, and I, I have the pleasure, some days pleasurable, some days not, of being in most of those corporate offices at any given point in time during the year. So... I'm going to give, I want to talk about some facts of what e-commerce looks like today. Uh, I pulled some interesting numbers to while I was preparing for this presentation uh, that are coming out of the, uh, coming out of the 2018 numbers. So there are 1.66 billion global digital buyers in 2017. Um, they haven't updated the 2018 number yet. There are 7.6 billion people in the world. That means 21.8% of the world's population now buys online. Pretty amazing. When you consider 22 years ago, when I started in this business, online selling didn't even exist. The number of it is expected to rise to 2.14 billion by 2021. Interestingly enough, men spend 68% more online than women which I found interesting. Uh, my wife is here with me today, and we had some interesting dialogue around that topic the other day while I was working on this. And uh, Gen Xers actually shop more online than baby boomers and millennials. But millennials are actually expected in the next, as, as their economic situation changes, millennials are going to very shortly in the next four to five years be the largest purchasing group. 2018 e-commerce sales accounted for 11.9 percent of all worldwide retail so you guys keep hearing about the retail apocalypse I'm sure you guys have heard that term um, at this point in time you still have 78 percent I'm sorry 88 percent of total retail done at brick and mortar so I don't quite think the retail apocalypse that everyone has talked about has really happened this number though is expected to rise uh, to 2017.5% uh, of all worldwide retail sales by 2021. So you see where this is going. You see that this is going to continue to get bigger and bigger and how that's going to impact the rest of the rest of the marketplace. So what we're going to talk about today is how has this affected brick and mortar uh, retail in the United States and what what is what is brick and mortar retail doing about that? Well, there's been a record number of bankruptcies. Uh, I've, I had two of my major accounts at Meyer Corporation file bankruptcy last year that cost us about 22 to $23 million worth of revenue. So that has had a very, very big impact. And what has been interesting about that is one plus one never equals two. So when one retailer goes away, you never see all of that business come back at another retailer. It never the market share never fully shifts to one place where it can be fully tracked. You'll usually see a one to two point increase at other retailers that are operating in some of the same competitive areas, but you never see one plus one equal two in those cases. There's been a record number of store closings. I'm sure you guys are reading a lot of the media. I'm sure you're talking about a lot of that in your class now. Uh, retailers are closing stores at a record rate. They're downsizing the retail footprints that they have. They're creating smaller spaces. And what a lot of that has to do with is you're starting to see a lot of retailers. Williams-Sonoma is a perfect example in our world that way over indexes. They're doing close to 60% of their total revenue now online versus 40% in stores. And what that's doing is creating a heck of a problem for them in terms of being able to manage that overhead because there's so much more overhead involved in what they're doing with the brick and mortar stores versus the on managing the online businesses. So it's really requiring them to get smaller, get more efficient, get more nimble. Yes? Right. 
our industry actually does lend itself very well to online. Um, but no, I'm not, we are not seeing retailers like a Macy's, retailers like a Kohl's, uh, even a Walmart. We're still seeing a much, much larger percentage of the total revenue coming from the brick and mortar than we are, than we are with e-commerce. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see where we tend to find that you see that over index happen is when you get into very, very specialized things like you see out of Williams Sonoma, where you're more professionally focused based on the, the types of products that they offer. Retail struggling to balance the overhead, which is basically what I had just said of brick and mortar versus web sales, which is driving significant retail restructuring. You know, Macy's, one of the big things they're doing a few years ago, they uh, talked about when they were going to go to free shipping with their online business, which is now a pretty standard practice for most big retailers. And they were going to do free, they went to free returns. So a lot of the retailers are really struggling to try to figure out how to, how to, how to change. What Macy's has done is they've now opened up locations within their stores called Macy's Backstage. And a lot of that has to do with they're taking so much stuff back online. They've got to have somewhere to sell that product that they didn't have before. I actually, when I was meeting with the Macy's executives and we were discussing this strategic move on their part, and this is, has a lot to do in the fashion side of the business, people trying things online. I'm sure you guys have heard of Zappos uh, shoes. Uh, the fact that you could buy, you could, you could order 10 pairs of shoes, you could get them home, you could try them on, you could buy one, keep one, and send nine back, and it was all free. And I told Macy's, and I, she, she'll give me a, a, an, an interesting look from the back of the room. I said, my wife is going to be your worst nightmare. Uh, because, you know, in the big, big scheme of things, when you talk about retail and you talk about having a cost to return goods, you're probably only going to order one to two pair knowing that it's going to cost you to send whatever you send back. Whereas in that case... But what's happening is it's putting more and more pressure on retail in a lot of cases to offer these high service levels, to offer the free shipping, to offer these things at no cost and try to figure out how to make that work within the normal margin structures. So you've seen a lot of pressure roll downhill to suppliers across all industries because of that. Kohl's, here's another example. How are they evolving? Kohl's is now partnering with Amazon for order. You can order something on Amazon and you can have it shipped to a Kohl's location and you can actually pick it up in a Kohl's store. So Kohl's and then Kohl's actually now takes returns for Amazon products. So you're finding brick and mortar retailers who are looking for new ways to try to partner to, you know, to, to uh, Amazon gets referred to often as the evil empire. Uh, but you find we're finding more and more brick and mortar retailers are trying to figure out new ways to ultimately partner with and, and find ways to run businesses and find effective ways to partner with big, big companies like Amazon that have changed the way they have to do business. Walmart, free order pickup across their locations, which what they're trying to do is they're trying to figure out how to use the massive amounts of inventory that they have in their 3,600 to 4,000 stores nationwide where you go on walmart.com, you order something and it tracks you to wherever your location is, what maybe zip code you live in based on how you place your order. And then you can go pick that product up free in their stores. And they're pulling that inventory directly from the shelf versus having to order another, another unit. So they're trying to figure out how to turn most of their stores into fulfillment centers, 3,600 fulfillment centers that create a lot of efficiencies. So trying to figure out ways to blend that retail and that brick and mortar. Yes. I know Target's doing that too. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and do you find that helpful? Yeah. Uh, good. Okay. I got what I wanted at two store. Like if I had, if I had it fixed, it would have been that many times. Mm -hmm. Let me ask, a, that's an interesting point. Let me ask a couple questions and just see a show of hands. How many in the room are willing to pay more for faster service? How, how many are willing to accept a delivery time of over 48 hours? You're willing to accept a longer delivery time. That's interesting. I would. Well, I'm not the actual college student. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. Well, yeah, but, but let me tell you something. You guys are probably some of the most, in, most educated consumers that have ever hit the marketplace. And the, the, the level of service that you're expecting because of how this technology age has really driven retail, actually, you guys are the ones who are driving this. And that's a positive thing. You're driving service levels and those expectations and what they are. And I actually was expecting that when I said who would wait longer than 48 hours, I wasn't expecting to see a hand in the room. Sure. See, and I'm I'm the worst about being patient, and uh, my 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 wife would would uh, agree with that. But I'm I am the worst. I'm the most impatient consumer in the world, and I am actually willing to pay more. I'm willing to pay expedited shipping if I have to to get it because of time. I think that's the difference. Like we, I w I'd rather not wait at first, but I'm not gonna pay. Like I'd rather not get the item than pay for to get it faster, or like just getting it in my car and go to Walmart. So two-day free shipping is a perfect world yeah, for you. Yeah, right. And Amazon, you were saying, is like the king of the world. Like yep. Because they have, on a lot of products, even if you're not a Prime member, you right. can get free two-day shipping. Mm -hmm. So that kind of has instilled a sort of, I guess, like habit, yeah, expectation yeah. on the consumer that. Well, hold that thought because at the end of this presentation, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about us as a company and how we, what type of pressure that puts on suppliers and I think you'll find that very interesting because that is the gold standard. Two day free delivery is the gold standard out there in e-commerce right now and it does put a lot of pressure on suppliers to figure out how to deliver that service without an additional cost to the retailer. Increased acquisition activity to strengthen position. So what I mean by that is you have a lot of e-commerce startups. Um, Neeraj Shaw and Steve Conan, who are the founders of Wayfair, actually I do business with them and I actually have breakfast usually every year at the Houseware Show in March uh, with those guys and we talk about, they, they did a little over $4 billion in revenue last year. And as we talk about how, how that has evolved, they're looking to buy small e-commerce companies and so what they're doing is you see a lot of very focused e-commerce businesses out there that focus on specific categories. They're looking to acquire those businesses to gain fast entry. A few years ago, Walmart decided they needed to get a lot more aggressive with their e-commerce business so they acquired a company called Jet.com and the CEO of Jet came in and actually took over Walmart e-commerce. So there's a lot of M&A work happening right now in the industry and there are a lot of people making money right now based on a lot of the small startup e-commerce companies and economy of scale that, that brings a sizable percentage of consumers to the table. And this is all happening while Amazon continues to push those service levels higher and higher and higher. You know, they're, they're getting down to in some of the major metro areas now that they're making deliveries in hours. I, I, I don't know how many of you guys have run into this, but one of the big dilemmas that I've had on a couple of occasions, you place an order with Amazon and you make a mistake and you almost can't cancel it because it's already in process so fast and it's out the door so quickly that if you don't cancel that order in the 15 minutes probably tops, you're going to get it and have to send it back. You know, I think and I believe there will be a, a point that the service levels will become too fast because I think there's a negative that can happen in that with the consumers. I know for me, I've gotten stuck with things in a couple of cases where I ordered it, I wanted to cancel it and I couldn't cancel it and then I get it and then it's sitting on the, sitting on the, in a box on the shelf at home and you forget to return it, you forget to what happened. So I think there's going to be a balance and eventually we're going to see some of this balance out but in the meantime you're going to see those service levels continue to get faster and faster. So that's a little bit about how retail has been affected. How, how has this affected suppliers and what are suppliers doing about it? And this is where I'm going to give you some insights into our world uh, as a manufacturer and as a supplier who are doing business with a lot of these companies. We have a very unique view of, of this and of e-commerce because of some of the services that we offer as a company that I think will also give you some good insights. So. What type of outside market challenges have been created by e-commerce sales? 
challenges, managing price, map challenges that uh, devalue brands. So you saw the big portfolio of brands that we actually sell. And how many of you are familiar with map pricing, MAP? Uh, map pricing, for, for those to, under, to explain, and a lot of your clothing and fashion lines have, have map pricing as well. Map pricing is minimum advertised price. Um, there is a, there's an act called the Robinson-Pacman Act that uh, ultimately uh, keeps manufacturers and retailers from being able to set retail prices, which is price fixing, which is, it makes price fixing illegal. So under Robinson Pacman, as a supplier, I can't tell a retailer what they have to retail my products for legally. I can't force that, I can't dictate that. Map pricing is the minimum advertised price that I wanna have a product out in the marketplace. Because obviously, 22 years ago when I started and I was talking about those 50 plus retailers that we worked with as a company, you know, I could, Macy's or Federated Department Stores at that point in time, Macy's was made up of seven different divisions. You had Macy's East, you had Macy's West, you had Bonton, I'm sorry, you had uh, Burdines in Miami, you had uh, Riches, Lazarus Goldsmith here in, uh, over in Atlanta, uh, and then you had uh, some other companies, Bon Marche out on the West Coast. You could sell different divisions of Macy's a product at different prices and they didn't even pay attention to each other. So you could offer an opportunity buy here, not offer it here, so you could be very strategic. Now, if I sell Macy's something at a price that is a product that somebody else is selling, usually based on the algorithms and the electronic um, uh, price measurements that are out there always monitoring the web to see what things are being sold for price-wise, that minimum advertised price, Usually my phone or one of my sales team's phone will ring within five minutes of a price being changed on Amazon because alerts go up all over the country with other retailers and that's how fast they can pay attention to where a price gets changed on something. And then they come back to me and they say, where's my margin money? Because I'm losing margin because I'm having to go match this price and what are you gonna do about it? So minimum advertised price, uh, the way we work that and the way we manage that as a company is we don't go in and we don't tell them you have to sell it for this price. We say this is the suggested retail price you can sell it for. We give a lot of advertising money, we give a lot of digital analytics, search engine optimization, Google AdWords. We spend a lot of money out there doing, uh, helping them drive their business to the tune of anywhere from 15 to 20 percent. So if they do a million dollars a year with us in sales, we're possibly giving them $200,000 in funding support to help them do their marketing, to help them drive their business. So the way we manage that map advertising or that map minimum advertised pricing is we say, look, we're not gonna tell you what you can do as far as pricing, but as long as you adhere to this price, we're gonna give you that money. If you don't adhere to this price, which is just fine, you can do whatever you wanna do, you don't get the money. And that's very, very effective in helping keep pricing uh, from turning into pricing wars out there in the marketplace. And that's how manufacturers help uh, motivate retailers to do, what, do the right thing. But with online selling, that has created a lot, a lot of problems for us because there's so much visibility and with so much technology monitoring pricing, um, we have a lot of heated conversations with retailers if somebody drops a price on something. And then you get into a situation where Amazon drops the price, Macy's matches, Kohl's matches, uh, uh, any other retailer matches. Then you try to get the price back up, no one will move. They'll say, we're not gonna move until Amazon moves, or we're not gonna move until this. And so then you end up with five different retailers trying to get everybody to make a pricing move. Uh, and you can't get anybody to move because everybody's looking online and they won't move until somebody else makes the first move. So. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that 22 years ago when I started, you spent no time on this. So pricing is a big topic. Managing unauthorized sellers. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the marketplaces. You go on Amazon and you see that little box over in the corner that says fulfilled by Amazon or fulfilled by some other company that's actually selling on the Amazon website. Well, that's created a big problem because uh, in this day and time, there's a lot of problems, especially in the fashion world. There, it, the online business has created an immense problem for retailers in terms of counterfeits, 
uh, which is a big, big problem that I'm sure at some point you guys are going to be discussing in some of your classes. So how manufacturers try to manage those third-party sellers that are unauthorized. They're not a customer that is authorized to sell your products. So you have to try to find out, number one, is the product they're selling legitimate? Number two, how did they get it? You've got to try to track. So there's an immense amount of, of, of work that now goes into all this behind-the-scenes research that we have to do just to try to keep up with who's got what out there online and where did they get it, and, and, and is it really ours? Product visibility and impact. So the promotional things I was telling you about. It used to be you could go sell different promotions to different retailers. Now the visibility is so tight that everyone sees what everyone else is doing so quickly that it has required us as suppliers to figure out how to restructure all of our promotional activities that we do nationally now. Um, created a lot of unique, and that, so the point here is you can begin to see all of the unique characteristics and complexities that online selling has now added to, to what used to be a very, very simple process. Infrastructure requirements and service level expectations. So this is something that as manufacturers that again 20, 20 years ago we, we didn't have to worry about. Uh, service levels where you placed an order and we shipped it. So internal company challenges and opportunities. So on top of that when you talked about a minute ago what type of infrastructure, what type of details have we had to do? Well I was saying earlier about how buyers used to just be you, just, you were buyers and you'd walk in, you'd, you were a sales guy, you'd work with the buyer, you'd place your orders, you'd walk out with an order in hand and that was that. Now, as companies, we actually have developed, you know, had to develop an immense amount of non-traditional marketing capabilities to support all these other things retailers are doing. Search engine optimization, Google and digital analytics, uh, specialized copy and creative because the copy and the photography that you use online and you know, websites has to be of a different quality level that, than, than the pictures that you might take for a regular print ad. Um, the copy, copy has to be created so that you ultimately come to the top, you rise to the top when you go through that, when you're sorted through that algorithm, when a customer goes online and types in a word that they're looking for something. How that copy gets written is how you ultimately get ranked and get brought to the top. So understanding how consumers search products in your categories are extremely important in terms of being able to maximize your effectiveness. Give you a perfect example that we, we actually brought this to Amazon's attention about a year and a half ago and it shocked us because we're a, we're a sizable company but when you compare that to an Amazon and how big they are, we're small. We actually had been putting product descriptions out on Amazon. Think about a saucepan, for instance. You go on Amazon, you're looking for a saucepan, you type in two-quart saucepan. Right now, you do that, and about 375,000 saucepans will pop up on Amazon. 375,000. So how do you cut through that clutter? How that copy gets written, that information, that description that you're reading about, how that gets written ultimately helps bring you to the top based on how consumers are searching that information. We figured out that consumers were actually shopping significant, um, well, significant numbers of consumers were shopping Amazon using Spanish words. So we came back and we added, we, we actually took all of our copy and we translated it to Spanish. So you had an English paragraph and a Spanish paragraph. And to tell you what that did for us, when you type in word saucepan, all of a sudden we came to the top in a total of about 210 products versus 350,000. So that's how much work's going on behind the scenes. You've got teams of people now, you've got developers, web development specialists. These guys are doing nothing but trying to figure out how to sort through all the algorithms and all the detail that Amazon's putting into how they're driving their business and how they're targeting you as a consumer when you're walking around looking at things on your Sales and business development teams evolution to business managers. You know, when I was talking about walking in actually selling something, you walk in Amazon, you don't have to sell them to get them to put your product online. Literally, you go in and you say, here are the new products, and they say, okay, we'll have them up in two weeks. 
So you're not selling product anymore. There's not sales focus. Now it's business management. So companies like ours and companies like a lot of the fashion companies are being required to figure out how to put teams of people together who are business managers focus specifically on figuring out how to put all the tools together. And it's a jigsaw puzzle of figuring that out to maximize how our product gets sorted, how our product gets viewed, and how our product ultimately gets, a decision gets made in that path to purchase. Again, when you're searching for things on your phone, all this is going on behind the scenes. These teams are specializing in those tools and the assets to maximize the algorithm exposure and big data, big data and the analytics behind that. Google search words, all that is actually now, I've got teams of, I've got 12 people who do nothing but do analytics work around Google Analytics and words and what words and how they get searched and what groups of consumers use those words to search specific products. We actually now have a team of five people who do nothing but handle the Amazon account that we do about 35 million, $40 million a year with Amazon. They do nothing but manage that account and I even have an employee now that works in the Amazon office in Seattle. Yes? So, do you have a team of, do you have like a whole bunch of Google Analytics team, and then do you have a separate team of like copywriters who are creating your content? Yes. Yes, but they work very closely together. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> you know, and that's an example. We've always had copywriters, we've always had people who were creating information. Now we've got copywriters who are creating information for, again, those regular print ads that you see, but then we've got a separate team of copywriters who are working on creating information that's specific to online and e-commerce and digital. And that, that gets into the last point here of infrastructure requirements and dropship service levels uh, based on expectations for consumers. So we break e-commerce into really three tiers as a, as a supplier. Uh, and the three tiers that we break e-commerce down to are what we call pure play e-commerce accounts like Amazon, Wayfair, that are true e-commerce only companies. You have drop ship, direct to consumer e-commerce businesses, Macy's, Kohl's, uh, Walmart, JCPenney, pretty much anybody. And what I mean by that is if you go on Macy's today and you order a Meyer product, you're not going to get, that product isn't going to ship out of the Macy's warehouse. It's going to ship from my warehouse in California directly to you. Uh, so drop ship capability is extremely important in that drop ship capability with the consumer uh, focused e-commerce companies. So all that copy, all that content that I was talking about a little while ago that we're creating, we're now creating all of that digital, all those digital assets for these websites helping their teams with our products, videos, all the things that ultimately, again, make sure that we get ranked correctly. The problem with this second one, drop ship direct to consumer, is all of a sudden now what that does is that changes the whole nature of the game with the Amazon and the Wayfarers of the world because now they're not a customer anymore, now they're a competitor. So guess what, if I'm drop shipping a product directly to you as a consumer, I've got to be able to ship that product and get it to you within the same service level expectations as you're going to be able to go on Amazon and get it. So now I've got to set up warehouses, I've got to set up all this infrastructure behind the scenes to do this to help support these other retailers and that is coming back to us as a manufacturer, it's not falling on them as a retailer. So that's an interesting concept. So you're seeing more and more of that responsibility being put back to the suppliers. And then lastly, the internal company website. So we have our own direct websites and we're out there competing, trying to sell product direct to you as a consumer through our own websites. What, again, we can't do, we can't break those prices that we were talking about. I can't go out there and compete on a price point with my other customers like a Macy's, a Walmart, Kohl's, Amazon, any of those guys. So what I've got to now do is now I've got teams of people who are doing nothing but focusing on our own websites, web developers, creating content, wireframes in terms of focusing on you as a consumer and how you shop and trying to get you to come to me first versus competing with these guys. That's a pretty tall order for most manufacturers. So in pure play e-commerce, we talked a little bit about this earlier. But we have dedicated management teams, internal employees at Amazon, and that 
they literally do nothing but engage on day-to-day -day analytics focused on navigating the ever-changing tools, assets, algorithms developed by Amazon to, to capture and complete the sale to the end consumer. How many of you guys have ever gone out uh, and looked at something you wanted to buy and then suddenly a day later you're reading a Yahoo News article and let's say you were looking at a watch all of a sudden the company that you were looking at the watch there's ads all the way around that that so you've just been targeted and you've just been tracked and we've got teams of people who are doing that we're spying on you we're spying on everything you look at we're targeting we're tracking you we're looking at what you're shopping at we're looking for patterns in what you're doing and then we're using that information that gets created and, and analyzed digitally to figure out how then to come back to you and keep that in front of you day after day after day. Amazon's the best at it. But it's a little scary. Um, it's, it's a little scary and it's a little, uh, it, it makes you feel, and I, you know, and I, I, uh, uh, we laugh about it, but it, it's a little bit um, scary just in terms of how much information gets collected on you, so uh, all of us as consumers. And we manage the love-hate relationship while, min while uh, minimizing pricing issues to long-term brand equity challenges. You know, the big problem is keeping that minimum advertised price I was talking about earlier, if prices are getting footballed all over the place, there isn't anybody at Amazon that changes a the price. They have, it's all, it's all electronic, it's all algorithms that are searching the web, and if they see a price that ultimately is lower than theirs, the computer automatically does it and nobody ever even knows it happened. And so now what's happening in that case is you're starting to see as suppliers, we're working with retailers and we're losing complete control because there isn't even a, there isn't even a person, there isn't even a live body that's sitting there that's making these changes. So dealing with that, I've now got teams of, I've got four people, a team of four people who do nothing but surf the web every day, looking at pricing and making sure we don't have any big issues. And we've got digital software now that searches for those things that send us a report every morning telling us how our products are priced so that we can then every morning start talking to, making phone calls to the retailers on why their prices are not in line with where they need to be. Long-term impact of that is you, your brand equity. So if you've got a high-end brand that you're really trying to protect that you don't want discounted, you guys see that in the fashion world more than anywhere. Um, trying to manage that where you're not seeing those products getting, getting discounted is a big, big challenge across the board today for everyone. And then we're working to evolve the asset uh, investment strategy to maximize the ROI. There's about 30 or 40 different tools that Amazon will come to you and say, we'd like you to give us money for this. We'd like to give, you, give us money for this. Give us money for this. We spend now on a $40 million, $35 to $40 million business at Amazon. Uh, this year we'll spend somewhere between $8 and $10 million just on all the tools and assets that they have available for us to invest in to try to get our product to the front of the line. That's why you've seen the profits at Amazon in the last two to three years skyrocket. Up until a couple of years ago, Amazon wasn't even making money. Now they're making billions every quarter. And they've done that by basically putting pressure on us suppliers. That's where that love-hate relationship comes in. Dropship direct to consumers, so in talking to this, so again, very similar. Dedicated analytics teams focused on SEO copy creation like we were talking about, maximizing consumer impressions on consumer-owned website, focused uh, customer, customer owned websites, focused on data analytics, sales information generated from online selling to maximize brick and mortar customer experience too. So this is an interesting thing that what I mean by that, and I'm going to show you a couple of maps here in a minute that will give you a better visual on this. So we do about 30% of our total e-commerce business through drop, uh, our total, total company business through dropship. What that does, it gives me an immense amount of information for my digital analytics teams to dig through. So it's $100 million worth of business at any given point in time. I can measure, I can look at a product, I can take a Rachel Ray, let's say, uh, uh, orange porcelain enamel set, 
and I can lay a heat map out across the United States and I can see exactly where that set sells the best and I can break that all the way down to a zip code. I can take that data now based on selling regions and we might have five different colors and where 20 years ago back in the old days when I was talking about how we used to go to market I'd talk to the retailers and we'd say okay how, how, how are we doing with this? Well, you need to put these three colors in all stores across the country. Now we can actually use this data to analyze and say, okay, red sells best in the northeast, green sells best in the southwest, and we can actually go in now and lay out a map for Kohl's or Macy's or JCPenney or any of the big retailers and say, this is how you actually need to distribute the products and the, and the inventory that you have across your stores to maximize that return on investment and to increase turn rates, minimize dollars tied up in open to buy. So there's a lot of efficiencies that get created by this. So here's an interesting map. Uh, this, is a, this is a picture of our dropship business for 2018. And so you can see all the big area here that's open. Our distribution center is located here you see all of a sudden what the, what the East Coast looks like. 62% of our e-commerce business comes from east of the Mississippi River. But we're sitting on the West Coast in San Francisco. Does that have an effect on that two-day delivery we were just talking about a little while ago? Absolutely. Or what happens is I have to pay for an expedited service over standard to get that product there faster. Or the retailer has to do it and then they come to me and guess what they say? Your warehouse isn't specifically located in a good place for us, so we need you to pay us back the difference. So if let's say we had a distribution center sitting here that would allow two-day service, standard, but since we're here, we have to pay for expedited two-day service, and let's say standard would be $18, expedited is $24, they're expecting me to pay them that $6 back. So all of a sudden, this is where that service level of me keeping up with Amazon becomes a big important part of how we structure ourselves. We can break, this is the breakdown kind of showing you, we can even break down the states and see where we're shipping to. Yes? It comes right out of profits. So. Obviously, I'm motivated to have distribution centers located in the proper places because it helps me. You, you can spend the money one of two ways. You can spend it by paying for that extra service or you can spend it on having a distribution center in the right place. But either way, you're going to spend it. <clears throat> so internal company-owned direct websites. What, what does this bring to the table? Dedicated analytics teams working to maximize SEO and copy, as we talked about, very similar to the dropship with Macy's, Walmart, uh, Kohl's. Uh, it's all about the customer experience and a reason. You've got to give these customers a reason. Why, why do they want to come to Circulon.com or why do they want to come to RachelRay.com versus just going to Amazon? I've got to be able to do something better. I've got to be able to do something different. And it can't be based on price because as soon as I drop my price, guess what Amazon's going to do? So you begin to see the complexities. Extra margin. The nice thing about this is that the extra margin allows us as a supplier to do some unique things to create those better service levels. And I'll give you a perfect example. Let's say I've got a cookware set that I'm selling to... Macy's for, I'm selling it for $60. They're retailing it. In our world, retail margin is usually 40%. So if they buy it for 60, they're selling it for $99.99. Um, my internal margins, let's say is 35% of what I'm marking the product up. So at $60, $60, uh, let's say just for ease of doing the math, let's say 20, 20, you knock $20 off of that. And so I'm landing a set of cookware for say $40. When I say landing, it means I'm bringing it in from our manufacturing uh, uh, facilities in, in Asia. De clearing customs, paying the import duties, doing all that. And I end up with what's called a landed cost to get the product here. Then I mark it up to wholesale, and then wholesale gets marked up to retail. When I'm selling products direct on my own websites, well, I'm selling it for full retail, but I'm buying it 
basically at landed cost. So now what this does is it gives me as a supplier that regular wholesale markup and I'm also capturing the retail markup that the retailers would normally be spending. So it gives me a huge margin then that I can pay for expedited shipping. I can pay to give bonuses away, gift with purchases, all these kind of things that ultimately try to motivate you as a consumer to buy a product on my website without discounting the price. And dedicated web development teams because now we're building our own websites. Now we're fully competing with Amazon and that's a pretty tall order when you've got a lot of smart people sitting around. So what does that map look like? Well, here's a map of business that ultimately we monitor that we do through our own websites. It looks very similar to the other map, just not quite as filled in. But again, you can see 60, 62% of the total e-commerce business is still coming from east of the Mississippi River. So we actually are now looking at how and where do we need to go build a manufacturing facility or a second distribution facility. So this is a great, color map to show you that right now we're located here in the Bay Area. You can see that the yellow is one day standard. All of this orange is two day standard. Three day, four day, five day, you get up into six days and then you get into Puerto Rico and you get into Hawaii and, and, and Alaska and those service levels can change. So the challenge that I have right now in terms of why we're doing what we're doing is I'm offering two-day service on this much of the country standard. I've still got this much of the country that I'm not offering that two-day service on. And guess what? You saw the map a little while ago, 62% of the business is from here over. So you can see how now we're having to evolve as a company in order to continue to maintain that service levels. And all this is going on behind the scenes just trying to maximize that path to purchase in terms of getting you motivated to buy our product. And in order to do that, I'm considering building a new warehouse or distribution center somewhere right here around southern, uh, somewhere either around uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, up in this area, or somewhere in here around Lexington, Kentucky. And then let me give you an idea of what that then looks like. So all of a sudden you do that, now look at how that map's changed. Now you've got one two-day, one two day and I'm hitting about 85 percent of the total customers in the United States that I can offer standard two day service to at no extra cost. All of that goes on behind the scenes just to figure out where to put a facility to ship from so that you get the product in a time frame that you expect to get it. So with that um, that's that's my presentation. I hope that what this has done for you is it's given you some things to think about. It's given you some, some insights into all of the inner workings that go on behind the scenes. You, know, you go out there and you see that uh, article of clothing on a shelf that you want to buy or you see it online. This is everything that's going on behind the scenes in terms of just making sure that that product gets to you in a timely manner. And with that, I'll open the floor up. We've got about, uh, I think, about eight minutes for questions. I either did that good of a job or that bad of a job. <laughs> well, yes. So that's a great call out and um, that's a phenomenal question that you asked because when I was talking back earlier about the third party sellers the, on the marketplaces like Amazon and places like that, um, we, we, it's called intellectual property. So photography, if we have photography of our product, if we have pictures of Rachel Ray, we work with Aisha Curry who's also uh, Steph Curry's wife who um, we work with her, we have photography, um, all of that is owned, that intellectual property. So that copy that you're talking about is what's called intellectual property. And the way that's controlled so that it can't just be used anywhere is we own that and we have 
intellectual property rights that you can actually go after unauthorized users. If someone puts a picture of Rachel Ray or a paragraph like you were talking about up on a website and they're not an authorized seller, we can go after them. And actually we use that quite often because you get into such a gray area when you start going after unauthorized sellers because if they went to Macy's and bought a set of product and they put it on their website to resell it, we can't stop that. But what we can do is we can stop them because right now if you take an image from one website and transfer it to another or you take copy from one website and you transfer it to another, uh, we can actually go after them for infringing on intellectual property rights. And we use that today in a big, big way to combat a lot of the unauthorized sellers out there on the web. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, it's about 30 dropships, about 30 percent of our total. And what you're what you're talking about, what we is what we refer to as 3PLs, which are third-party logistics companies. And that's what a lot of see. We're a pretty sizable company, so we've got assets and we've got funding and abilities to build all this ourselves and do it ourselves. But if you're talking about a, you know, we're a, we're a half a billion dollar company in terms of what I manage from from the standpoint of our business just in the U.S. and Latin America. But when you start talking about companies that might be a $5 million, $10 million small family owned company that's trying to figure out how to drop ship to get out there and be competitive, they can't go set up a distribution center. They can't do the things that they have to do. And that's where a third party supplier like you're talking about comes in where they'll go out and they'll contract and they'll say, we're gonna put our product in your warehouse and pay usually a fee of seven to 10% on the cost of goods. And ultimately that, falls in line, they build that into their profit margins and it works and then it allows them to meet that expectation. So it's a lot of different angles that you can come at it and quite honestly we're actually because what we want to do is spend about two to three years doing some research and really understanding the numbers. We're not going to build an East Coast Distribution Center first. We're actually going to work with a third party fulfillment company on the East Coast, probably somewhere around Cincinnati or Lexington, Kentucky. And we're going to work with them for a three-year period of time. We're going to look at the numbers, understand the information, learn our way into that almost like a case study for ourselves. And then what that will do is give us the ability to come back and say, okay, if we build a facility, this is what it's going to cost us and measure the two side by side to truly understand what that overhead is going to look like. The industry, meaning uh, which, which fashion? Yeah, like how you do it here in general, like what's the best way? I have, an, I have a thought on that. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm uh, unique in that I like clothes, and um, this is a, uh, you know, most guys, they have a pair of shoes or a couple pair of shoes. I, I got a shoe thing, and I, my, my wife and I, we, we laugh about that because I think I got a bigger shoe problem than, than she does. Um, but I believe that this is going to reach a certain point, and it's going to level off. I do not believe that we're ever going to reach a point in time where e-commerce is going to be 60, 70, 80 percent of total retail because especially in the fashion world and I will tell you right now I have tried I've tried on a couple of occasions to order things online you get it it doesn't fit then you have to go through the process of sending it back and it to me it's a lot more cumbersome and heavy lifting especially in the fact that if I'm buying clothes I want to be able to touch them I want to be able to put on a pair of shoes see how they feel I believe that customer experience is always going to exist but I believe it's going to be specific categories. I think our industry very well could end up being 50, 60 percent of a total on e-commerce because who really wants to go touch a set of pots and pans in a store? Big deal. But if I'm going to buy a new suit and I'm going to spend two grand or three grand on a new suit or I'm going to spend five hundred dollars on a pair of shoes, I don't really, I'm not really interested in going out there and, and, and buying that 
online and shipping it to me and trying it on, shipping it back and going. To, I want to be able to have the experience of interacting with the product at the point of sale. Now, I might do that and then order it online later for service or, qual you know, or for efficiency there. But I believe certain categories like, like fashion, I think fashion is going to continue. You're going to always see retail brick and mortar be a big, big part of that because I just think the way the customer interacts with the product is, is too, too specialized. Now, there's going to be, it, but it's also going to depend on where those products are positioned. The higher you go, I think you're going to continue to see high-end retail continue to be, brick and mortar retail continue to be focused. I think you're going to see more low-end stuff. It'll be more focused online, but I, I think it's, there's a number of factors that play into that. I think it's going to be what the products are, what sectors of business they fall in, like clothing, fashion. Um, and then I think it also will have to do with how those products are positioned within each of those categories. All right, guys, we're out of time. Let's All right. Thanks, guys.